Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on optical coherence elastography, imaging stiffness on the micro scale. My name is Michael Leitner, and I'm product and sales manager for OCT at Four Labs. And it is an absolute honor for me to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Brandon Kennedy from the University of Western Australia in Perth. Dr. Kennedy is associate professor at the School of Engineering at the University of Western Australia, head of the Bright Lab at the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research, and he also serves as chief scientific officer at Oncores Medical. He received his PhD from Dublin City University in 2006, and his doctoral thesis focused on nonlinear polarization rotation in semiconductor optical amplifiers. Dr. Kennedy's current research focuses on the development of optical coherence tomography and elastography and the application in a range of fields like oncology and tissue engineering. Dr. Kennedy has published more than 80 peer-reviewed journal papers and has won a number of awards, including in 2019, a West Australian 40 under 40 award. Questions can be posted throughout the whole course of this webinar in the Q&A section, which you can access through the icon on the top right of your screen. Well, Brandon, I'm happy to have you here with us today, especially as it's already 11 p.m. in Perth, and I hope you have a good cup of coffee with you, and now the stage is all yours. Well, thank you, uh, Michael. It's a great honor to be able to present um, our group's work here and um, to be invited to do so by Thor Labs, um, who we've worked with very closely over the last number of years. Um, and thank you, everybody who's listening in. I hope you're um, staying safe um, in whatever part of the world you're in in these challenging times. So just to outline the talk, first of all, um, I'll start with a technical background of optical coherence elastography and specifically uh, the technique that we've developed in our lab. And I'll then focus on um, the two most prominent applications um, of the technique that, that we're focusing on, namely uh, for tumor margin assessment in breast conserving surgery, and also um, a more emerging application in biofabrication and mechanobiology. But if we step back a bit, um, let's consider what elastography is, and that's to image the mechanical properties of tissue. It's um, pretty well established at this stage using ultrasound and MRI. Um, it's both clinically deployed and commercially available, and its application to OCT um, is far newer, um, but is gaining increasing um, momentum. Um, the advantage, of course, of OCT elastography is that it provides increased resolution to five to 10 micrometers, but only to that limited penetration depth in tissues of one to two millimeters. So it's really suited to niche applications, um, some of which are in surgery and in tissue engineering, but also in ophthalmology and others. Um, to give you a kind of a sense of the relationship between the scales at which uh, OCT elastography and ultrasound elastography perform. I've shown two images here, uh, one from um, ultrasound elastography of a, a breast cancer lesion and from a different um, tumour. And um, some of our work from the surgical field where you can see again a, a tumour in the centre of this image. So ultrasound elastography provides that centimetres depth penetration, but you can only see a kind of coarse outline of the tumour. You can't really distinguish much within the tumour. Whereas with OCT elastography, you can distinguish at the micro scale fine details both within the tumour and the surrounding tissues. And that's really key to where we see value in this particular application in breast cancer surgery. To take you through some of the main steps in, in elastography, there's four in, in general. The first one is to apply some kind of mechanical load to the tissue. And you then image it, in our case with OCT, before and after the deformation has taken place. We then need to take those deformations measured with OCT and input them to some mechanical model of the tissue's deformation. Um, and that allows us to compute an elasticity parameter or property, um, such as Young's modulus, which can be mapped at each pixel in the image to form these two or three dimensional images, um, which are often called elastograms. In OCT elastography, 
there's uh, the, the classification of the various techniques that have been proposed are often done by the, the um, manner in which the load is imparted to the tissue. Um, here we see the three main types of OCT elastography, which are compression OCE, harmonic OCE and transient OCE. Um, the transient OCT often performed as shear wave OCE is where generally you have non-contact loading with the tissue, for example, an air puff or um, a laser induced deformation of the tissue. Um, and you then track the, wa the waves that are propagated um, by this load in order to extract the um, elasticity parameter of interest. Also of prominence is um, not an OCT technique, but indeed an optical elastography technique. That's brilliant microscopy, which actually doesn't impart any load to the tissue. Instead, you use the natural vibrations of phonons in the tissue to derive the bulk modulus, which is, is, can be related to uh, elasticity with some simplifications. So I think the advantage of the three techniques to the right here is that they can be implemented in a non-contact manner so that they're very suitable for applications in delicate tissues, such as in ophthalmology, for example. Brilliant microscopy also finds a lot of application in cell mechanics because of its high resolution. Our focus in our group, however, is on compression OCE. And this is where we make contact with the tissue to a deformation of about five to 20% bulk strain. And we then use a PZT actuator or some other um, means to impart a local deformation to the tissue uh, on the scale of two to 20 micrometers. If we also can measure the corresponding stress or force applied to the tissue, it allows us to map the elasticity. And the advantages as we see it for compression OCE is that the uh, manner in which the load is um, effectively coplanar with the um, with the optical beam means that you can you can um, you can you can um, fabricate quite compact imaging probes and also it's got a relatively rapid acquisition speed um, in comparison to the other techniques and that's mainly because we just need to measure the deformation at two positions whereas with some of the other techniques you need to sample more more finely the um, the deformation induced to the tissue. However, it's not a it's not a case of one technique being better than other than than the others. Really, all of these techniques are trying to access the same information, um, and therefore can have similar um, success in that. It really just depends on the application you're after and the exact uh, manner in which you want to extract your mechanical property. Um, and for the applications, we're uh, focused on compression OCE is most suitable. And to go into a bit more detail about how a generic compression OCE sample arm looks like, and we apply our force via the compression plate, and we can compute that as stress, as stress is defined as force per unit area, and the measured deformation that we can um, measure using OCT in the tissue can be used to extract the strain, which is normally defined as the change in the thickness of the material over the initial thickness. This is quite a simplistic um, a view of the deformation induced. In reality, the elasticity is defined as a, as a fourth order tensor, where the stress and strain themselves are both second order tensors. So we need to be cognizant of the, on the, on the diagonal here, that the normal strains and stresses imparted to the tissue, as well as the shear components of stress and strain. The upshot of that is that there's actually 81 elasticity constants um, defined in continuum mechanics um, for materials, soft materials like tissues. That would introduce a lot of problems in terms of measurements, um, but also in terms of how you would visualize and present that information um, eventually to a, to a clinician or to a biologist. For those reasons in elastography in general, and definitely in OCE, we make a number of simplifying assumptions namely that the tissue is linear elastic, isotropic and incompressible. These aren't always um, assumptions that are made, but invariably they are. And in our case, we also measure the only the axial component of displacement. What that means is that we can simplify our, um, our, our um, two um, second order tensors to just looking at the axial component of stress and the axial component of strain respectively. If we can map both of these parameters, we can combine them and their ratio to, to estimate elasticity.
So first of all, I'll talk through um, strain and how we measure that. And strain imaging in itself is is used as a um, as as a as a contrast mechanism in OCE, um, but it's far superior to also measure the stress. But this is also a little bit chronological. We all started out by trying to measure strain before we could figure out how to measure stress. So how we do that is to use phase sensitive detection. Um, and we, we use spectrometer based OCT systems, but any phase stable system can be used and colleagues have also used them, um, sweat source uh, lasers and FDMLs. What we do is we acquire a B scan in with one compression state once we've applied that preload. We then increment the PZT actuator to um, an increase in deformation, acquire a second B scan. By subtracting those B scans um, and through knowing the um, average wavelength and the refractive index of the sample, um, we, can, we can estimate the displacement throughout the two dimensional field of view. In this case, I show experimental data of a soft silicon phantom, which has a stiff inclusion, which you can just about make out here. If we look at uh, um, the displacement through the center of the inclusion, we get more insight into how we can perform our strain imaging. And you can see that when you're in the softer material, you've got quite a steep gradient of displacement with depth. What that means is that locally in that region, the sample is deforming. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's got a local strain, which is uh, characterized by the slope of this line. When we move into the stiffer material, you can see that there's almost no change in displacement as a function of depth. What that is indicative of is the stiff region is translating within the softer material, but in of itself, it's not deforming. We quantify this local strain by measuring the slope of the displacement as a function of depth at each location along each A-line in the two-dimensional field of view. We can then map that into our two-dimensional strain elastograms. Um, so we're not quantitative yet, but we can already see quite strong mechanical contrast here. We've got very low strain in the stiff material, as we'd expect, and much higher strain in the surrounding soft material. We typically perform this uh, fit in the axial dimension um, over a range of 15 to 100 micrometers, it dependent on the underlying uh, resolution of the OCT system. And we can approach strain sensitivities um, of 10 micro strain. Um, like with all OCT systems, we can scan in the Y direction to acquire three dimensional images. The only difference with our strain imaging is that we need to acquire two um, B scans at each Y location. And at each, for each of those two B scans, we have to increment the PZT actuation so that we can impart that local strain at each Y position. And this is an early result um, I show on this slide comparing the 3D OCT to the 3D axial strain imaging. And we purposely constructed this uh, silicone phantom so that the optical properties were quite closely matched. We were really trying to just demonstrate that we could see additional contrast with uh, compression OCE. It wasn't obvious at the outset that that was the case. So this was a, a, one of the one of the first times we demonstrated that in 3D. I've got the um, OCE resolution here defined as the axial fitting range of 100 microns and the lateral resolution as that of the um, of the OCT system 11 microns. However, it's a little bit more complex than that. We also, in addition to the OCT system resolution and the signal processing um, induced resolution, we also need to consider how the tissue deforms and that deformation also imposes a third um, restriction on resolution, which is described in detail in this paper from our group here. I don't have um, time to go in. I'd like to progress on to the applications as well, so won't dwell too much on that here. So now that we've, we've defined how to measure strain, we need to consider how to measure stress. Initially, we thought, well, why don't we just use a, um, a force transducer? But the problem is that often they're not sensitive enough to pick up the, um, the variation in, in uh, force which we're applying to the sample in this local um, mechanism. But more importantly, you don't get a two dimensional view of the, of the stress. You typically get one measurement of, of the force, one measurement of stress. What we, we really want is to map the stress. The solution we came up with, um, optical palpation, is to use a compliant um, um, silicon material. It's actually the same material we use for our um, phantoms. And um, the key thing is that it needs to have similar stiffness to the tissue that you're trying to measure. We place this silicon material between the tissue and the imaging window, which also acts as a compression plate. 
And then when we apply our deformation, what we see is that we have much greater deformation in the silicone layer above the stiff inclusion than we do in the surrounding material. And that's really the key. What that enables us to do experimentally is measure the strain of the um, in the layer. Um, why that is interesting is that we can um, also characterize the stress strain relationship of that silicon material. So before we, we, we do our, our OCT scanning, we can use standard compression testing to, um, to, to plot this stress versus strain curve. That in turn allows us to then map our experimentally measured strain from our OCT image in the layer to the corresponding stress at the tissue surface. And then we can we can do that at each location in the XY plane, allowing us to map the surface stress, um, as is shown here again for, for, for a, 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 an inclusion, a stiff silicon inclusion. And we've used that as an imaging technique in its own right. Um, so here we see two examples. Firstly, of a stiff star-shaped inclusion, and we can see that we do drop some resolution in comparison to OCT, but we can pretty much map nicely the, the um, contours of the star in this um, stress image. And more interestingly, um, in tissue, in this case, excised breast cancer tissue, we can pick out not only the variation between tumor and surrounding adipose, but also variations within the tumor. For example, this N represents um, a necrotic region where there's uh, much lower stress than the, than the surrounding stiffer tumor. What we found interesting about this is that this is simply based on imaging the, the, the thickness of a, of a layer. There's, we don't actually image into the tissue at all to generate these images. And that may be useful in certain surgical environments where you might have blood or other obstacles to the uh, optical beam, which might um, obscure the, um, the imaging. Um, but the, really the reason that we wanted to do this, as I mentioned, was for imaging elasticity. So um, if we go back to our diagram here, we, we've shown how we can measure strain and now how we can measure stress. So by combining these two together, we get our elasticity map. I should note that we do have an additional um, assumption in the stress measurement. We were assuming that the stress is uniform with depth. We found in the applications we're looking at that once the mechanical heterogeneity and depth is not too strong, this assumption holds quite well. I'll also point you to two pieces of work, two papers that we've uh, we've published, which try and really challenge those assumptions. In the first one, we actually map the entire strain uh, tensor with a with a novel processing technique, and in the second, we do we solve the inverse elasticity problem to effectively get access to this um, stress tensor as well. And we definitely see improved accuracy when we do this, but it's a lot of additional computation and also um, um, data acquisition. And so we, we, we currently feel that for the applications we're looking at, it's not warranted to do that, but we continue to pursue this more as a kind of a, um, for, to deepen our theoretical understanding of the, of the technology. So, okay, so now we've got our elasticity map. I'll just show you one example, early example again of uh, an elasticity image of, of, our, of breast cancer tissue in comparison to the um, corresponding OCT and then the co or the, the validation by histology, which is our gold standard. And this shows nicely, I think, how we can um, achieve higher uh, contrast over OCT alone, and also how we're quantifying stiffness now. So these values of stiffness for stroma, fibrous tissue and tumor, match quite well with what we can find in the literature for these uh, types of tissue. And also importantly, um, we validate with histology that indeed this elevated stiffness here in red corresponds nicely, not only to where the tumor is, but also within that tumor, the variations in elasticity match quite nicely the variations we see in, in histology. So with this technique, um, which I should say we call quantitative microelastography, it's really just our version of compression OCE, but I'll, I'll refer to the technique as QME or quantitative microelastography for much of the rest of the presentation. We've been looking at a number of different application areas for this technique. The vast majority of that um, in, the, in the last few years has been in, in tumor margin assessment, but also increasingly in mechanobiology. So these are the two most prominent techniques. So I'll, I'll focus on them, but we are very interested. We're based in a medical research institute. So we've got access to lots of tumor biologists and people who are interested in vascular biology and physiology. So we're also expanding our, um, our horizons into those areas as well, where, where this technique can, um, can, 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 can help. Okay, so the basis of our work in breast conserving surgery 
is um, really based on the fact that breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy, which involves removal of the tumor and a margin of non-cancerous tissue surrounding the tumor, that's really the most prominent type of breast cancer surgery in, in places like North America, Europe and Australia. Um, and importantly, the um, um, prognosis for the patient is as good as mastectomy, which is removal of the whole breast, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it leads to the removal of much less tissue, so it's a better outcome for the patient. The problem, though, with breast conserving surgery is that in between 20 and 30 percent of cases, there's a re-excision because this illust what's illustrated here on the right happens. There's a, a positive margin where we have tumor at the edge of the excised tissue. The problem is that the, um, we only know that days later when the pathologist looks at the tissue under his microscope. So by then it's too late for that surgery and the patient has to come back for an additional surgery. So if we could provide an intraoperative tool, perhaps using our uh, quantitative microhistography technique, we might be able to tell the surgeon during the surgery that they need to take an additional region of tissue, hence saving um, um, a lot of the um, um, positive margins seen days later. So um, I'll talk through how we do that, first of all, in a benchtop imaging system. Um, typically, OCT systems will give you a, a, an imaging field of view in the on-fast plane of 10 by 10, maybe 15 by 15 millimeters. But we really want to image the entire face of a breast cancer specimen um, so that we can uh, tell the surgeon if there's cancer anywhere on that surface. So what we did was we, we created a wide field technique where we mosaiced nine partially overlapping um, 16 by 16 millimeter images like so. And that, that gives us this entire face of the, um, of, the, of the breast tissue. At the moment, that's just OCT. We have our validated histology, where now we have to actually stitch together three histology slides as well, because we're looking over a, a region much bigger than the standard um, histology cassettes. But we can see that in the histology image, we've got a lot of dense tumor in the central region here. From OCT, we can clearly delineate the dense tissue from the adipose tissue on the left-hand side, but we struggle to differentiate what's inside the, the dense tissue. And that, that's where we often struggle with OCT. We've seen that in the literature reports that as well. But when we overlay the elasticity information, um, we can now see these hotspots of elevated elasticity in red, which again, when we sit down with our pathologist, he tells us they match up quite nicely with where he identifies tumor in the in the gold standard H and E uh, stain histology. So we initially performed a lot of this imaging on mastectomies. That's not the clinical use case here. But when we were um, um, demonstrating that the technique had some value, we didn't want to do that on diagnostic tissue. So we took dense tumor from the central region of mastectomies. But where we where we really want to test this technique is in the lumpectomy specimens or wide local excisions. That's the clinical clinically relevant use case. So we set about um, designing and implementing a diagnostic accuracy study where we wanted to determine the sensitivity and specificity of both OCT and quantitative microlistography in detecting close margins, which we defined as one millimeter from the boundary of excised specimens. Um, from lumpectomy surgery. So in the protocol, we, we scanned uh, tissues from 90 patients. 71 were of those data were entered into a reader study and 19 were used um, to generate a training set. In almost all but one, I think, of those cases, we scanned two margins. We had about 50 minutes to do so. Importantly, our, our goal here was not to scan the entire um, volume of tissue and give the surgeon feedback uh, during surgery. At this stage, we only want to test um, if we if we can actually correctly accurately identify tumor, so we didn't need to scan all of the tissues. We after we performed our scanning, we sat down with the pathologist, did the matching with histology, so we had our uh, our reference point, our gold standard, and we then enrolled uh, seven readers, a combination of surgeons, pathologists, uh, radiologists, and engineers, and um, who read these uh, images uh, with some guidance in the uh, without knowing the the outcome, of course. Here's two example images from that study. And um, the first one on the left hand side is invasive ductal carcinoma, the most common form of breast cancer. And we see very elevated stiffness um, in a region which corresponds to invasive tumor. Um, in the car in a, a separate example, which is a benign or non-tumorous tissue, we see um, maybe flecks of high elasticity, but by and large, very low elasticity in that region. So that's really the basis of our delineation of the of, 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 of tumor. 
The OCT image, again, you'd struggle to maybe differentiate exactly where the tumor is um, in either of these images. Um, so I think this demonstrates, in this case, at least the, the advantage of, of quantitative microlistography. The results of the blinded reader study are presented here uh, for each reader, but I'll maybe point you to the aggregate results at the bottom, where we see uh, sensitivity and specificity from OCT of 69 and 79% respectively, which matches quite well with some previous literature um, on OCT um, accuracy alone. We then, as expected, saw an elevated elast uh, sensitivity and specificity of 80 and 99% respectively when we combined quantitative microlistography with OCT. But interestingly, when we only used quantitative microlistography, we had the highest sensitivity and specificity of about 93 and 96% respectively, which was a surprise to us. But to explain that, I'll, I'll on the next slide show you the um, decision trees that we generated to give to the readers. So this guided the readers um, when they were making their decisions. Initially, these were very elaborate um, um, kind of um, mazes of decisions, but we soon realized that if you want to get um, busy surgeons, pathologists, radiologists to perform, um, to, to, to do this reading, you need to um, make sure it's going to be pretty brief and, um, and um, won't take uh, days upon days to perform. So looking at the literature in OCT, as well as our previous work with OCT and um, the training data, we uh, we thought that the two main things in OCT that distinguishes tumor is that the tissue, solid tissue is continuous with depth. It's not um, always the case, but very often in the OCT signal, you've got this continuous signal with depth throughout the OCT imaging field of view. And also very prominently, we see a breakdown in the organization of the tissue. So you see um, um, a, a kind of banded structures and, and heterogeneous um, structures in the tissue when you've got tumors. So th they were the two main decisions. We also um, um, indicated tumor, uh, or sorry, mucin, uh, the presence of mucin as, a, as, a, as an indicator of cancer. In quite a few of the cases we looked at, we saw mucinous carcinoma, which is a fairly rare type of breast cancer, but was quite prominent in our study. For the elasticity information, we simply um, asked the readers to see if, if there was a circle within the imaging field of view where the elasticity was um, predominantly over a, a threshold which we determined from previous data. And when we combined the two, we tried to combine the um, criterion in OCT of the, um, the, the um, solid tissue with depth with our elasticity information. And I think this is what tripped up the readers. Sometimes it's difficult when you get in, especially for non-OCT experts, when you get into depth in the image, it can be difficult to know where the continuous tissue stops and the noise starts. And I think that was a reason for the low OCT um, sensitivity and specificity in some cases. Um, however, we still believe that it's through the combination of OCT with elasticity that the um, uh, sensitivity and specificity can be raised even further. It stands to reason that that might be the case um, because you'd have more information. So we spent a lot of time scanning excised tissue, but the surgeons that we've, um, we've been talking to for a long time are most interested in uh, having a handheld probe that they could use during the cancer surgery, as that would make the process much more, um, much less disruption to the workflow and the directly scanning the tissue in the patient. So we set about trying to do that. Uh, the handheld probes and OCT compact ones will invariably have MEMS mirror. And that was our first challenge that MEMS uh, devices have a much lower resonance frequency than standard benchtop galvanometer mirrors. That means you have to typically scan slower, which leads to two forms of motion, art or motion artifact manifesting in two ways. Of course, um, distortion of the imaging geometry, but also in our case, a variation in the load and that preload we're applying to the tissue, which can lead to a um, decorrelation of the phase and corruption of the elasticity image. So we, uh, we used the Thorlabs handheld scanner to perform this initial imaging. And uh, on the top here is the raster scan pattern employed in the Thorlabs probe, which is really a modification of a standard raster scan you'd use in a galvanometer mirror to, with, with a smoothed edge. The uh, volumetric acquisition time that um, for, for our field of view, et cetera, was 20 seconds. That was unacceptably high. So what we did was implemented a bi-directional scanning technique where we, um, we, we also, um, removed some of the electrical filters in the device so we could scan at a faster rate. But importantly, we scanned both on the rising and falling edge of this um, sinusoidal-esque scanning pattern. And we would then flip the, the falling edge relative to the rising edge so that they're in the right orientation with respect to each other. And that's allowed us in the results I'll show you to scan volumetrically over six by six uh, by two millimeters. 
in less than four seconds. We've currently got that down to about two seconds, but um, I haven't got any results from, from the two second scans. But here's a, a first validation on the excised tissue. Um, this form factor, that's the off-the-shelf Thorlabs probe, is not really suitable for in vivo in the breast cavity, but it was very, very suitable for our initial ex vivo cases. And we can see that the CCD camera in the probe was really handy, actually. That allowed us to match the local region of tissue scanned to a more global photograph of tissue, which was helpful for co-registration with histology. If we look at the elasticity image, we can see that um, we don't have the image quality as good as we as we had on the benchtop system, but we can clearly delineate matched with histology again this region of invasive ductal carcinoma from the elasticity information, the elevated elasticity. Um, again, with much higher contrast than you can see in the OCT scan. Uh, we hope that that uh, reduction of the scan time to two seconds or less uh, will further improve the image quality by reducing the motion artifact further. But what we've done with the device is we've modified the probe or built a new probe now that was useful for breast or um, usable in breast cancer surgery. It's still not in the ideal form factor because uh, we wanted to have a kind of prototype probe to see how that went in surgery. So we've used this probe for um, 21 in vivo patients to date and four surgeons have used this probe. In order to get um, this device into the surgery so that we, we met the ethics and governance standards in our institution, and we needed to not only sterilize the probe using hydrogen peroxide, but also cover it with a surgical sheath. Um, so that's not without its problems in terms of optical imaging, but we were able to generate images which are, um, again, giving us contrast that we're used to seeing on the benchtop scan. So for example, here, um, this is an in vivo section of the cavity. We see elevated elasticity in this region. Now, the corresponding tissue that was removed, so the, the tissue corresponding to the in vivo region we scanned, and um, when that was assessed by the pathologist, they saw a positive margin. So that would suggest that this elevated elasticity is um, again corresponding to tumor. We don't have the same one-to-one -one match as we had previously. By the same token, we see low elasticity in this uh, second case on the right-hand side, and there was no tumor in the corresponding uh, excised margin to this in vivo case. So this is very early um, um, results, and we can see further degradation in our image quality. Now we're dealing with a, a surgeon having potentially more motion artifact in a, in a theater environment, the patient potentially movement. So um, the increased speed will definitely come in handy. But this gives us encouragement that the results we've demonstrated on the benchtop are translating through to the in vivo case. OK, so I've stepped through the ex vivo quantitative microelastography and the in vivo case. But I wanted to return to that idea of optical palpation. Um, what's really uh, intriguing uh, for us about optical palpation is, again, all we're doing is measuring the thickness of a layer. So um, how accurate is optical palpation in detecting tumor? Because if it is accurate or accurate enough, then we can potentially implement optical palpation with a much simpler imaging system. We don't necessarily need OCT to do that. So before we got um, too far into coming up with new techniques, we, we looked at our data again, processing it this time to just have optical palpation and calculating the sensitivity and specificity again. We did this with a, um, um, an algorithmic based um, um, reading rather than a, a, another uh, um, human reading study. But we can see that the results we're getting are quite good. We've got a sensitivity and specificity just from the stress, just from the deformation of this layer of 83 and 86 percent respectively. Much higher than we can get using OCT in this application. Still less than we got with elasticity alone because we don't have the depth sectioning or the quantification of elasticity. But these numbers are really encouraging and if we could get these up to 90 percent or so, we're now approaching what would be considered excellent um, sensitivity and specificity. I've got two examples um, of each of the three images that we've, we've created, OCT, um, elasticity and stress, and this just shows that we can see much of the contrast in the elasticity image also in the optical palpation or stress image. So we thought, okay, let's, let's try and implement a, a simpler um, imaging system to, to do this palpation so that we might be able to come up with a device that's far cheaper and maybe more efficient. So the technique we came up with is based on using a digital camera um, to measure the deformation in the layer. How we do that was to create a new type of layer 
where we use our standard PDMS uh, silicone, but we now incorporate silica or sugar granules into the material before it's cured, so that we end up with this solid material with embedded regions of sugar. Why we used sugar was that we can then dissolve the sugar out using water, so we end up with a, a microporous layer, a microporous silicone layer, which has um, pores with approximately 50 to 100 um, micrometers diameter. What we then did was insert this porous layer into our compression setup, where we again have a, a win, an optical window acting as a compression plate. S is our sample, but we replaced the OCT system with a simple digital camera. And um, now what we see is that when we've got a uh, low compression, low preload in the sample, we don't deform these um, voids, these these pores much, and not much light travels through the um, the layer and back to the camera because the, of the refractive index difference between the silicone and the and the um, and the pores. As we increase the preload, increase the compression, we start to collapse and and make the cross-sectional area of those pores smaller. So more and more light starts to transmit through the layer and back to the camera. And we can see that at high preload, we've got a, a, a pretty high transmission through the, um, through the layer. We choose a green layer here, which is an intermediate layer between the tissue and the, and the porous layer, because we don't want the variation in signal coming from the um, tissue to corrupt our measurements. We chose green because that was where the, um, the uh, optical sensor was most sensitive. But effectively what this approach allows us to do by using this microporous layer is map the um, stress imparted to the tissue in the uh, saturation or intensity of the camera. So we basically encode stress in uh, transmission of light um, through, the, through the layer. Of course, like in the previous optical palpation, we can pre-calibrate the stress strain response of the layer and then relate transmission or saturation to stress. And that gives us these um, stress images, which are almost to the same quality as we were generating with the OCT-based palpation. Here's a preliminary result from a breast cancer specimen again, where we see the um, high st um, stiffness in the um, tumor. This is invasive lobular carcinoma, matching quite closely where, we, um, where, where the pathologist tells us the cancer is. Um, so that's quite encouraging. That also opens the door to a lot more applications what we've recently done is um, modified a case of a, um, a standard smartphone, incorporated a macro lens and some lighting and, and, a, and a window to be able to use the standard camera on a, on a, on a, a phone um, to perform optical palpation. Now, why that might be useful is for telehealth applications. In Western Australia, for example, in many places around the world, there's an increased trend towards remote um, and uh, treatment of patients in remote and rural settings. Um, and because we've even established collaboration there is in burn scar assessment. So in this application, we put the layers on the tissue and then we just use a, a standard phone that the user presses on the layer and we're able to generate these uh, stress maps where we can correlate quite nicely different regions of the burn with the um, or of the scar with the, um, with the with the stiffness measurement. So this is again preliminary, but an indication of the direction that we're going with this work. The last section I wanted to talk about was um, a change in direction a little bit away from more clinical applications of the technology, more towards applications in mechanobiology and biofabrication. So I'll just talk briefly through two areas we're looking at there. And actually the motivation for this one is clinical as well. Um, so it, it's related to rupture of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, which can result in hearing loss, vertigo and infection and other problems. Um, this is particularly uh, relevant in Australia as the Aboriginal people uh, have the highest prevalence of perforated eardrums in the world. Um, the current uh, treatments that surgeons use is to take um, a graft from tissue quite close to the, to, to, to the ear and they then um, implant that to kind of seal the tympanic membrane, but the acoustic and mechanical properties of that tissue do not match the tympanic membrane well at all. And so the uh, restoration of hearing is really hit and miss and is usually not very good. So with collaborators in the Ear Science Institute in Australia, um, they, we've started to look at applying OCT to this technique where they're looking at a silk uh, fibrin um, material, which is widely used in, in various biomaterials because of its biocompatibility, strength and versatility. For example, it's used in vascular grafts. And what they're trying to do is develop a photo cross-linking technique 
to um, 3D print these silk scaffolds. Now, the eardrum function, as I've mentioned, is really closely related to the mechanical properties. So we think that we're, we'll be able to help them in the design and characterization of their materials using uh, OCE. Of particular interest is that they want, they're interested in having stiffness gradients in one and two dimension across their, their scaffold, because from a, through a process called gyrotaxis, cells will tend to move to regions of um, elevated stiffness, um, and that will help to promote the um, migration of cells across the scaffold, and hence the, uh, the regeneration of the tissue, the native tissue. At the same time, they also want the silk to degrade over time. So separate to the OCT, OCE work, the elastography work, we've been also using OCT to characterize the degradation rates of the material. And I'll point you to this paper we published last year on that. But really, the focus of this is to look at the, the application in OCE. So um, what, what our collaborators have um, identified is that by increasing the laser power in this two photon lithography process, they're able to increase the cross-linking um, of, um, of the scaffold, and that increases in turn the stiffness of the scaffold. So the first thing we wanted to look at was, well, can, can we measure that change in stiffness? Because they didn't have a good way to do that on a micro scale. So if we look at the elasticity maps now overlaid at the different laser powers, we indeed see an increase in stiffness and um, with increase in laser power as expected. We also match that with the cell behavior. So we can now start to look at how, how cells behave on um, scaffolds of different stiffness. And interestingly, we saw uh, increased proliferation of cells in the softer material actually. We then move forward to start to look at gradient stiffness. And I should keep in mind that the, uh, we should keep in mind as well that the two photon lithography process was also experimental and needs some refinement. So we were able to, to, to measure the stiffness to tell our collaborators how well that process is working. And here again are some early results where we see, first of all, on the, um, the 1D stiffness gradient. The idea here was to create a, a linear increment in stiffness across from the left to the right. We didn't quite get there, and I think this was due to problems in the two photon lithography process, but we can indeed see uh, an elevated stiffness on the right hand side corresponding to the region where the laser power was highest to um, 1400 milliwatts. And um, we also um, started to look at 2D stiffness gradients where in this material there was an elevated stiffness um, due to the increased cross-linking in the corners as well as the central region. And we can see that we can pick that out quite nicely. So through this process of us imaging the devices, feeding back to the two photon lithography um, process, we might be able to optimize the materials so that we can um, not only control the two photon process in terms of stiffness, but also design these materials to optimize the um, promotion of cell um, movement across the materials, which we want for the regeneration of the, of the tympanic membrane. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was a few slides on um, imaging 3D cell elasticity with our quantitative microelastography technique, which is the direction where we're also taking in the lab. The goal, we did a preliminary study in this regard, and the goal was to use the technique to assess the effect of TAS activation on adipose derived stem cells. TAS is a mechanosensitive protein, and um, so basically what, that, um, what, what happens typically in stiff tissues, like tumor, for example, um, the, the uh, stiffness of, this, of the material surrounding the cell um, activates the TAS, which moves into the nucleus. The way this activation happens often is by increased actin production. So actin is the kind of scaffold of the cell which senses the stiffness. Um, and that leads to increased proliferation and spreading. And as I said, is, is closely linked with, with um, with, with metastasis of cancer. Um, while it's known that the increased um, production of actin should lead to an increase in cell elasticity, it hasn't been possible to image that cell elasticity in three dimensions. So we thought, well, that would be a nice uh, pro uh, preliminary target for our, for our technique. So what we did was we embedded um, these adipose derived stem cells in um, gelma hydrogels, which again, we, we used a, a UV uh, curing um, to, to, um, to, to, to cross-link the hydrogel. Um, and from this then, we, we looked at a couple of different scenarios. As a baseline, we first of all looked at the gelma without cells, and as expected, we see a um, quite uniform elasticity map. And in our histogram here in blue, we see quite a pronounced peak corresponding to the gelma. We then um, incorporated the non-TAS activated cells, um, and we see this um, double peak now in green in our histogram. 
one peak from the gelma, the other from the um, from the cells. When we have the TAS activation, now we activated TAS using transfection, um, as, as we were looking at, we, 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 rather than through stiffness. And we see that we, first of all, we have a, a, a dramatic increase in the proliferation of the cells, but also of the stiffness, as we've expected. Um, if we look in red here in the histogram, we see again our two peaks. Um, firstly, um, and most importantly, we see this elevated um, stiffness of the cells, which is what we were trying to measure, but we also see an increase in the stiffness of the gel. Um, and we believe that's because the cell is pulling on the surrounding gelma. And because gelma is a nonlinear material, that will um, increase its stiffness. And that, that's led to not only the broadening of the um, gelma elasticity, but also the, the shift in its peak. Um, we also matched, uh, not matched, but we also performed confocal microscopy with an actin stain just to confirm that the, these aren't co-registered, these are representative histology, but we can see when we have um, TAS activation um, with this actin um, stain, we see much um, uh, higher um, production of actin as expected in the regions of, of higher elasticity in comparison to just standard non-activated cells. Um, the other thing we, we, we started to do was just from a visualization perspective, we're now able to look at not only the, the 3D OCT image of the cells, but also the surrounding uh, stiffness. And uh, one of the things we're, we, we've implemented all of this with a, um, a Telesto 3 Thorlab system, but we're, we've also, we want to get to a higher resolution. And so we've, we've constructed an OCM, an optical coherence microscopy system, which we're now testing that, and that should improve our resolution by an order of magnitude. But just to summarize, um, I've uh, presented our version of compression-based um, OCE, which we call quantitative microhistography, which maps 3D um, in 3D the tissue elasticity. Um, I've outlined um, some of the applications in surgery and mechanobiology that we're, we're, we're most interested in. Um, we develop a range of different probes for the different applications we're looking at, but I've, I've uh, focused on the handheld probes for this presentation and the application in breast conserving surgery. Um, and some of the future directions that we're interested in taking this technology um, is really that low cost uh, variant of optical elastography, so the, the non-OCT um, technique we see a lot of potential in, as well as, as I briefly mentioned, um, uh, really high resolution. So if we could get submicron OCM systems, then we're, we're going to be able to really target the uh, intracellular um, elasticity, which has a lot of potential, we think, in, in the mechanobiology applications. So that's the um, conclusion of the talk. I, I hope that was useful and I'm very happy to answer any questions there may be. And uh, just want to um, acknowledge uh, a great group of people uh, within the lab who've worked on this um, over uh, the last um, number of years, as well as our collaborators, both within Australia and um, around the world, who um, have really um, made all this happening. And of course, the, the funding agencies which have supported the work. Um, but yeah, very happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Really, really interesting insights. We already have several already questions have for you. Uh, Jerome uh, Kaltmann from Kaltman Technical Kaltman University of Delft is asking, what are the advantages of measuring at constant load, so DC, versus dynamic load, high frequency? Yeah, yeah, good question. So the 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 um the way we look at it is that the um when we look at it kind of it's not quite static we still need to look at two load positions in order to get the deformation but that's it we just look at a given location at um one position next position and that's it we can measure the elasticity in that region some of the dynamic or most of the dynamic techniques require you to sample at uh, many more points um the deformation in the sample for example you might need to track the wave propagation across the surface also that wave propagation takes some time so we feel that the um uh, th this approach um, gives you the opportunity to scan as fast as possible which in the applications we're looking at is really important and um, there have been probes uh, using the dynamic techniques but often oftentimes with the dynamic techniques you need to apply your load at one position an image at another position and that can be uh, um, cumbersome from a, um, a, a, hand, a compact handheld probe uh, point of view. But um, th they're, they're just two advantages that um, are specific to the things we're doing. As I, as I mentioned at the start, 
those techniques have their own advantages. For example, um, it's more straightforward to quantify elasticity by measuring the, for example, shear wave velocity. And also you don't have to make contact with the tissue. So it's a, it's a case of courses for courses and matching the uh, technique that you want to use with the application that you're focused on, I think. OK, thank you. Kai Neuhaus from National University of Ireland at Galway asks if for static compression OCE, are the B frames co-registered before subtracting them? Uh, hi Kai, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so we only impart the deformation um, in, in such a way that we it's it's typically um, a couple of microns. So um, the the OCT frames are inherently co-registered. If we if we even if we need to co-register them, that would mean that we've put too much deformation on because that would mean that we've decorrelated the phase. So typically the phase um, the phase will remain will decorrelate way before you see. Um, much change in the structural OCT image. So uh, indeed, we, we don't need to um, we don't need to co or to, to align the images, but we do um, we do need to make sure we don't put too much deformation on that the phase decorrelates. There are also some techniques, and um, Vladimir Zaitsev and his colleagues in Russia have looked at a kind of there, there's two types of displacement that you impart when you strain a sample. One is what's called displacement induced decorrelation, and the other is strain induced decorrelation. So you can correct a little bit for the displacement induced correlation so that you can maximize the um, amount of load you put on but we we don't tend to, to do that we we um we we, we find that we get a, the optimum image quality without needing to do that james chiang from four labs is asking uh, does the tissue elasticity have any relationship with the optical biofringence properties will ps oct help measuring stress in tissue yeah, that's a good question, and I think um, um, some um, folks in in MGH are, are doing that. They're looking at the um, they're looking at PSOCT to to exactly to map stress because I, there's examples um, um, not OCT based, but where polarized light is used to look at the um, um, stress in 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 uh, plastics and things like that. And um, I'm. I'm um, it's not my area of expertise, so I don't want to sound, I don't know all the details, but it, it, for me it sounds like it might be complicated to measure stress from looking at the deformation of the tissue because um, how, do you dis how do you distinguish stress from strain? It's a kind of cause and effect thing. Um, so, so I think the, I think the biorefringence um, can, can definitely help and definitely can be, I think, changed by, by the strain, but to, to my mind, at least in the applications we're looking at, it might be difficult to um, quantify stress by looking at biorefringence in a tissue because that biorefringence or change in biorefringence would be brought about by the deformation rather than by the, um, the stress. Owen Watts Moore asked, uh, could the technique be used to make elastograms in a shear, st uh, in a shear strain if a shear strain was applied rather than a compression? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that, that's something we're actually, we've started to look at um, in some tissue engineering applications. So um, the applicant, what I've shown, you, you can't uh, in this presentation. I've, I've only shown that we measure the, um, we measure the axial deformation, but actually I've got, I think I've got one of the backup slides which talks to this a little bit. Um, so I mentioned that we do strain tensor imaging as well. That's where you, you measure every component of, of strain in every um, direction. So if you do this, then you, then you can um, not only measure the um, uh, shear strains, but you can impart strain and arbitrary orientation. So in one application, we're looking at stretching tissue and looking at how cells behave and develop while the tissue is being stretched. And we've employed this um, technique to do that. Um, you need to acquire a volume to do this, but it could be a, a small volume, but that, that's one complication. You could get one, com one shear component in the XY plane by just looking at B scans, but this uses a kind of um, variation on speckle tracking effectively that was developed by Yasuno and his team in, in Tsukuba in Japan um, for flow imaging, and we modified it for, for elastography, but, um, but most certainly you can, um, with this type of technique, you can look at shear strain as well as um, axial um, strains. Dana asked, for detecting tumors, it seems that the stress strain assumptions are reasonable, but do you think it is good enough for modeling the tissue behavior? 
for use in finite element analysis, for example. Soft tissues are usually modeled as hyperelastic and or viscoelastic. Is there potentially any way to extract these types of materials properties using OCE? Absolutely, and that, that's a really good question as well. I, I, I should stress that um, we, we know that the technique that we're using from a mechanical engineering perspective is, uh, is not um, optimal, but we're, we're just trying to get as, as good a technique to get the clinical or biological information that's needed. So oftentimes we want to scan quickly and we want to scan in probes, etc. But absolutely, we've, we've, uh, we haven't, we've uh, we published a few conference papers, but again, uh, there's some people in um, New Jersey Institute of Technology and um, the Russian group as well. They've actually published um, techniques where they measure the nonlinear properties of um, of tissue. So effectively, I mentioned the pre-strain or the preload we put on the tissue, but you can do multiple pre preloads, and in that way you can measure the um, hyperelastic properties of the tissue. We've also published a paper a number of years ago looking at the viscoelastic properties. So I think it's fair to say that any mechanical testing you can do in a standard instron type compression test can be can be modified for this technique because effectively what we're doing is instron with an OCT system detecting the deformation. A question from an uh, anemonous user. Uh, how sufficient is the assumption of linear elastic soft tissue behavior? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, different people will give different answers to that. Um, we found that it's quite reliable um, and I think for us in our application the proof uh, for us was in the, um, the diagnostic accuracy study we did in breast tissue and we we tried to control the, the preload in that case so that the tissue would be at the same um, pre-strain but of course all the tissues have, have different um, geometries and also um, locally inside the tissue you can have different regions under different compression. We found that at the still relatively moderate um, preloads we put on the tissue, the elasticity was was surprisingly robust. Um, but I, I know that there's some, um, so other people have, have shown quite strong um, nonlinear tendencies. So I think uh, probably uh, to explain that discrepancy further, further work is needed, but I feel maybe the, the key to that is on how much um, you try to extract the nonlinear response. And, and so uh, we, we were specifically trying to put as little uh, preload as possible on so that we hope to stay in the linear regime and that seems to to work in this application. I do feel though with the biomaterials work and um, like with the um, the silk scaffolds and the gel mist stuff and there's a, a whole bunch of potential in that area there you, you tend to have more time to scan so I think we'll probably end up circling back and incorporating some of these things like nonlinear uh, non-linearity, viscoelasticity, both of which are becoming more and more prominent in mechanical biology, and um, so we can incorporate those back into the technique. Adrian Podoliano from the University of Kent at Canterbury asked, uh, very nice, thanks Brenton. With the current level of technology, what is the most important for someone uh, beginner to OCE? Where to start? With the OCT technology used, the interaction uh, set up with the sample or with the mathematical algorithm? Thank you. Very good question, Adrian. And how are you? I hope you're doing well. Um, it's a good question. I think definitely not the OCT system. Um, I think, uh, I th I think um, not to <laughs> plug Thor Labs too much, but the Thor Labs systems were completely satisfactory for us. We, we usually use them. So um, the, the scan patterns do not need to be complicated. Um, I would probably start off by just trying to see um, deformation in a sample, not even tr the mechanical model. So if I if I shoot all the way back um, to the start of the presentation, I think I think one of the one of the hardest things, at least at the start, for us to get was reliable um, reliable plots like this to reliably be able to see the the, the the change in displacement as a function of depth. There's lots of little tricks that we indicate in papers, but of course until you uh, try it yourself it can be it can be challenging so um getting a good phantom it sounds trivial but a, a, a good phantom with us with the appropriate stiffness of let's say 10 to 20 kilopascals is really important you need to lubricate the um the surface of the sample and the interface between the sample and the compression plate that's really important because uh, soft tissues and silicone are incompressible that means when you try to deform them they need to expand in the lateral direction in order to deform. Other elastography techniques don't really see this because to them, 
the OCT field of view is maybe two pixels. But if you if you don't allow the sample to slip, then uh, it's going to be really hard for it to deform and you see weird patterns, etc. So I would start off, Adrian, just by um, having a PZT actuator synchronized with B scans and um, take a number of B scans um, loaded, unloaded, if you like, in with by the actuator, get the phase difference and see if you can measure this plot. And from there, it's relatively straightforward. It's really just linear regression um, to get to the strain map. Um, and then um, the, the um, it's not too much more complicated to add the, add the layer on once you get to that point. Martin Kraft from Forlabs asked, does the technology also work for liquid samples that uh, include solid materials, for example, biofilms? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so we really rely on um, the models that we use are from continuum mechanics, which assume that the tissue is or the sample is a, is a solid. And um, we, we've measured down to like close to one kilopascal, which is very kind of jelly like. But I think um, um, more rheology type experiments are, are approaches are the way to, to go if you want to also measure the properties of the fluid um, and i think um, for example in um, mgh again um, um, Simantin and um Matt Kearney has done some great work using speckle rheology to, 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 for that type of application. There's no reason that, why that couldn't be adapted to OCT, but our specific technique is mainly for looking at solid materials. But um, if you change the mechanical model to look at a more rheological model, I, I think you could certainly um, um, extract parameters in, in liquid type samples. And one more question by Martin Kra. Do you see it as realistic to integrate elastography as a standard measurement mode into a turnkey OCT system? Is the effort too high for an unexperienced user to set up the related experiment? I don't think so. I think um, the uh, if we look at the if we look at the um, the challenges, right? The the first one is um, hardware. The hardware is is trivial. It's a it's a PZT actuator. Um, um, synchronized with the um, OCT system. So you can take the signal either, either um, the A scan rate or the B scan rate, depending on what you want to use as your trigger, and um, use that to synchronize with the AC, with the um, the actuator. And now you've got a, now you've got your, your deformation um, technique set up, but you just need to make sure it's rigid, etc. cetera. And the, the biggest challenge from them is really, I think the, um, the, the, um, at the start, just getting to work on silicon phantoms, so making simple silicon phantoms, and and taking some time with the lubrication. It's 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 really not too tricky. Um, apart from that, I think it took us a long time just because we had to figure out a lot of this stuff on the fly. But um, but now I think in our papers and other people's papers, a lot of this is documented, and we're also very happy to share um any information or you know to have a um, a Zoom call with people if they if they were interested to to try and um implement this technique and, and wanted our guidance. And we're, we're in fact doing that with a number of groups around the world because we'd love to see this technique used um, by, by many groups. And um, so we'd love to help make that happen. OK, two more questions that just came in. Luca Bartolini, great presentation, Brandon. Uh, do you also have any comparison between attenuation coefficient maps and elast elastograms? Oh, yes, I do. I didn't actually. Hi, Luca, how are you? Um, I have that in a, if we have a second, I can quickly open it. If, is that okay? We had a, um, um, do I have time, Michael? It'll take me maybe 30 seconds to open a different presentation. Okay. But I, um, we, we've, we've recently, last year we published a paper um, where, where we did exactly that. Um, we've looked at, um, where's this presentation? <laughs> Uh, maybe I, I I can't find it as quickly as I thought. But no, we, we've we've done that. We've um, we've incorporated attenuation imaging with our um, elastography system in the breast cancer results, and we see some really interesting patterns. We see that the uh, attenuation shows some very specific uh, um, um, results in cancer, which tends to tell us different types of cancer cells. So the attenuation changes, and that matches pretty well with attenuation. We're also looking at the attenuation. Uh, how attenuation changes with compression and it, it actually changes quite a lot. So yeah, we're, we're very interested in, in incorporating as much information from OCT as we can. Um, but maybe, um, Luca, I can send you the paper actually that we've published on that after the presentation. Uh, 
Thanks for the question. And to conclude, Maxime Rivert asked, uh, Hi, Brandon, what techniques do you use to maintain phase stability in time in your interferometer? Ah, yes, good question. Um, we use a common path um, set up usually. So we, we actually disconnect the reference arm and we use the interface between the, that was another useful thing about this layer actually. We use the interface between the imaging window and the silicone as a uh, as a reference arm um, and so the lubrication also helps to control a little bit that reflection and um, previously when we didn't have the layer so before we implemented the layer for stress imaging we just imaged the we just had the window in contact with the tissue and that could lead to some modulation or variation in the in the reflection and then therefore in our reference arm so in a funny way um, using that layer also helps from the optical point of view to have a reliable reference arm but um, that, that's really important in the clinical systems uh, when we're in the theater or in the in the pathology lab. But actually, um, we we see that on a bench, it, it works pretty well as well. I think there's maybe three or four times degradation in phase stability, but usually that's is still okay. And certainly, if you've got a on a on a on an optical table that's floating, it shouldn't be any problems. But if there's uh, if you're using a dual arm system on a bench, you need to be careful about. Um, Things like air conditioning and um, 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 fans from computers and things like that, but it should be enough to get kind of them um, good preliminary results, I think. So many thanks again to everybody for attending our webinar today, and especially to you, Brandon, for the great presentation. See you all again during our future webinars, and have a nice day. Thank you.